you know, I was promiscuous at an early age, um, drank at an early age. Michelle, tell me about your father. What was he like? Well, I don't really know what he was like. My perception of the little bit of time I was around him would be that quiet, um, probably, probably as an adult looking back, you could see the insecurity maybe, um, the unsettledness. Um, he, yeah, I, I would, yeah, I would, I would say he's, there's probably some insecurity, some stuff going on in there, but he always appears to be very quiet and unsure of himself. Do you know anything about his father? I don't because, uh, my grandfather passed away. And I'm not sure how old he was when he when his father died, but I know my grandmother was a widow. So I'm and there's four boys, so I'm not sure I'm not sure when that happened. But yeah, my grandfather passed away. What's the one word you would use to describe your father? Absent. Just absent. Uh, are there any good things you learned from your dad? Good things I learned from my dad. Um, you know, I was I was thinking about that, and I I, I can't I, I can't I, you know I don't know that I have an answer. A good thing that I learned from him would be, uh, yeah, to not abandon my own child. Okay. Um, so I guess along those same lines, what are the bad things you learned? The bad things I learned. Um, Looking back and understanding what you just said. There are a lot of, you know, um, struggling in relationships. You know, um, I guess always looking to, uh, I guess, to other men or boyfriends or whatever to fulfill that loss of not ever having that, feeling that need to be loved and not understanding that um, I'm already loved and I am worthy, you know, and I am a valuable person, you know, whether he's around or not. So growing up without that father, uh, as a young child, a young girl, what do you think the impact of that was? Oh, it was, it was huge. Um, I don't, I don't know what it would like to be to have a father, um, but I know not having one, you know, I was promiscuous at an early age, um, drank at an early age. I never did drugs, but um, it, there's just this insecurity in relationships. My friends are like, you weren't shy. I'm like, <laughs> you know, but I guess it's your own. Maybe they didn't know how I felt. I don't know if I faked it. I don't know. But always searching for affirmation, needing affirmation, not understanding that, you know, you are good enough because you grow. When your father, especially I would say a father, abandons you, abandons you but both parents, you just you feel unloved. Um, what do you wish your dad would have told you but never did? I was going to say that he loved me, but I would have rather, that would have had to been followed up by actions. Yeah. I mean, I would have loved to know that I was loved. But just saying it, you know, you can just say it all the time and and have no actions to follow it and still feel unloved. What do you wish your dad would have showed you but didn't? If you would have had a father, what's the one thing you think is, is most important for dad to show their daughters? That um, how valuable they are. That their self-worth does not come from a man and to hold on to it as long as they can, that they are worthy, that, and to show men how to treat them. You know, you have, you have women out there that are, you know, wife material, and women that are women, you know, and, um, 
and the difference is that wife material women, they know how they deserve to be treated and how they want to be treated. And they, they know that their worth and value doesn't come from whether that man loves them or not. And they know that there could be five men that, you know, walk into a room and they all want to, you know, date you or be with you. But that woman is strong enough to go, mm, but you know what? You're not sent from God. Or, you know, I don't need to have sex with you to prove that I'm worthy or lovable. I mean, it's, women need to know that. They, they, they find their value. They think, you know, if they have sex with a man, that's where their value comes from and that they're going to get this man. And that may not be the man for them. You know, but they're, they're searching so much for love, just to be loved, that they're willing to find it anywhere. You know, as a follow-up to that to that statement, um, why do you think most women are that way? What what causes a woman to think that I need sex or I need to have sex with that man to, to make my life better? Where does that come from? Um, I can tell you one place it comes from and from experience that, you know, my stepfather molested me. So when you feel like this is the only way that you get love, or this is all that they love about you, I should say, you you take that into your puberty years, your teenage years, your adult years, and you think, well, this is the only good thing about me. That's what you believe. And so what you believe about yourself is what you will do. Um, and somewhere along the way, nobody ever told them that there was any other good thing about them. Do you think, too, does that come somewhere in women? Is that something that society shows us, too, I guess, by all the things that you see? Oh, the media all the media the um and what's inter it's interesting nowadays even dating it's almost like the first thing that you have to check off your list is well do we connect sexually instead of are can we be friends can we get along do we have anything in common do we share the same values or morals but it, the first thing on the checklist is well do we have sex good that's sad that's sad. So you've given the most important part of yourself away. And most men actually mistreat that. And what's sad is this is somebody's daughter. And would you want your daughter to be treated that way? I look at these men and go, would you want your daughter to be treated the way that you're treating these women? And then the women allowing it to happen. Do you want your daughter doing that? I mean, that's so, yeah, I mean, there's so much emphasis on sexuality and um, body type and image that we think that that's what's important. When did you realize the impact of growing up without a father and how it affected your life? Um, wow. Can I take a minute to think about that? That's a, that's, that's a good question. I don't know when I re really realized the impact of it. Um, maybe almost, maybe almost last year when I went to the Meadows for a week. You know, I did a workshop, and the first thing, the first workshop you have to do is Survivors One, and it's dealing with all your childhood issues from zero to seventeen, and being in there. And you get, to, you get to pick the people you want to talk to. So, you know, whoever hurt you, whatever, um, whoever abandoned you or whatever, whoever you want to talk to, you know. So um, picking my dad, and you actually go through the motions. They're invisible, but, you know, the counselor opens the door and lets them come in, invites them, talks to them by name, and you can say, you know, where do you, do you want them to sit here or would you like them to stand at the back of the room or, you know, this whole role modeling and um, you get to speak to them and write, you write them letters and say, 
the things that you want to say to them. And um, it was interesting because my ex-husband always said that I, because I grew up without a father, I didn't know how to treat a man. And I didn't fully agree with that um, because I am very loyal and faithful and I am respectful, which I know that men need. But there becomes a point where when you when you're not getting your needs met or you're having to play the both roles, um, the dynamic becomes messed up. So it can seem as if you don't respect or you don't know how to treat a man. Um, but I think it, I think it was probably <laughs> just a year ago that I realized the impact of, of looking back, of having to go back to zero to 17, the impact of not having what that did. You're somewhat aware of it grow through your life, but you, but really understanding the impact that it had, um, you know, even dating now, um, I don't date, I don't really date a lot and I have a real, God gifted me with discernment so I can automatically tell a lot of things and it's not a judgment, but it, it's, it's, it's just a, um, just a discernment, a sense of whatever, but, but, but finally learning to stand up for myself and saying, you know what, I am worthy and I don't need you and I don't need your worldly views, um, to make me feel important. You know, I want to be treated like a lady and this is, I want respect and honor and you know, I deserve it and, and, and voicing it and asking for it up front as opposed, as opposed to, um, being thankful that they like me. So it, so really <laughs> going through that last year, and now, and understanding that, going, wow, I feel so empowered standing up for myself, actually asking for what I want and not settling for anything less. And, and knowing that if that person can't give me that, then that's not the person for me. You know, and God, and God will order my steps and he will bring the right person. And not automatically thinking that, wow, this person must be my soulmate. I mean, we get along great. We have a great time. Sex is good. You know, everything seems okay, and, and it's not really, because that's not what it's based on. So, so I think the, with the last year is when I had really come to the realization. In high school, I drank. I mean, we lived to drink. I grew up in a small town, and, you know, all the guys had cool cars. I mean, even the girls did, but, I mean, the guys did for sure. Um, so... You know, we all partied and, you know, I would bong a beer and shotgun a beer. And um, so my thing were like wine coolers and beer. I didn't really drink hard liquor. I didn't have a taste for it, but drank a lot. My aunt and I snuck out of the house a lot. Um, we snuck the car out a lot. So living with my paternal grandmother, she was drunk. She was an alcoholic, you know, but we had really strict rules. You know, we couldn't, we could only watch certain TV shows and sit 10 feet back from the TV. And, um, we were in church three times a week. You know, we didn't go out to eat. She always made meals. I mean, but that was the how, but we had an uncle that lived in the house. We had two uncle. I had two uncles that lived in the house, one on one side and one had one side of the garage turned into his room and he was always high. And we would literally sneak that car out of the garage with him ne right next. I'm like, is anyone like aware? Are you just so high and stoned and so drunk and past? Like, I mean, it was crazy. But, um, you know, that was that. I guess that was my way of getting a feeling secure, because when I drank, I was a blast. I had a great time. and I got along, you know. Just life was fun, and you didn't really have to focus on anything else going on. Um, you could pretend almost, and um, and dating, you know. And so when guys would come along that were interested in me, I was flattered. You know, I was very flattered. I, I remember starting my sophomore year, and a senior would 
with his risky business glasses on would like stare at me on the stairway like he pursued and I thought that was cool you know and so I'm looking back and I look back at everything in my my life up until this point and I think that I made good decisions and that God brought me this person and whatever but I look back and I think everything was the same how did I meet this person how did I meet this person you know how did I meet my friends you know, what's, what's going, it was all, it's all the same pattern. And so I had to step back after my ex-husband divorced me and go, what, where is my responsibility in this? And what do I need to change? And, um, and not be guided by the past anymore and say, and just stand up for myself and know that no matter what has happened, that's all gone and over and I have a fresh start. And at some point I have to take over and take control of my life the way God wants me to and let him take over. So, um, yes, I look at all that and everything was the same. And as much as you want to deny it, and as much as you want to make an excuse for this situation and this situation and justify everything that's been done, it was still all the same pattern. And at some point you just have to go, you know what? I'm tired. I'm tired. You know, and, um, and, you, and no matter whether I had a father or not, I still have to take responsibility for my actions and make a choice to change and know that I am loved. And it's hard when you don't have a male figure telling you that they truly love you for who you are and not expect anything from you. Um, one of the things that, again, another message that we want to convey in the film is, and you spoke to it, it's the idea that I think so many of us get caught in that, okay, I got a father wound, so I can blame that on everything. You know, we all ha can have that victim mentality, but there comes a point where you got to say, okay, I'm done with this, I'm moving forward, and I'm not going to be a victim any longer, you know, for the unforgiveness and everything else that, that helps you get past that. But just sitting here listening to your story too, Michelle, I, I will say, you know what, there's no telling how God's going to use your story and how he's going to use the things that you've went through in the past and how you're going to be able to connect with, with other women as a result of that. And the incredible change that you can have, your story can have in their life. So that's just a word of encouragement. And you know, and you know. and what's interesting too is I think having an influence over men. I mean, there are a couple of men that are listening, going, "Wow!" With their own, you, you know, they're just now dealing with their own stuff, going, "Wow!" So, um, you know, however God uses it. You know, we all have a story, and I think what people really need to understand is you're not alone. We all walk around thinking we're the only one going through this. We're the only one that had to deal with this or this, you know, because you look at the outside of people's lives and you think that everything is great. And a lot of times people will go, oh, I wish I had their life or their, I did that growing up. I wish I had these parents or this type of life or whatever, but we don't know what's really going on. And we have to be careful what we wish for. But I think what people need to know is that you're not alone. There's always somebody that's been in your shoes that can relate or understand. And if we open up and, and reach out, and I think what makes some women scared too is, and even men, is, is, is having reached out sometimes and getting shot down. So we have, to, we have to not get discouraged and know that there's somebody out there that's, that, that can impact us, that can help us or steer us in the right direction. What do you wish your dad would have done differently? I wish my dad would have made an effort, just some sort of effort, just um, consistency, just even living in another state, letting me know that no matter what, I was the apple of his eye. You know, that he loved me, that I was important to him. You know, it's really hard knowing that He's got another family, you know, and I have a half-brother that I barely know that, you know, he does a lot for. Um, he's always there for him, and that's his kid. And, um, you know, it's, it's um, very difficult. I, I just don't understand how you can know that you have a child in this world 
that you have nothing to do with. How do you think growing up on a father specifically has impacted the way you relate to men? Well, I think initially part of you doesn't trust them. I think that's the first thing. I think you don't trust them. Um, and so it goes back to you trying to do everything you think you should do to keep them. That you think if you, if you do this or, you know, some of it's performance. Um, some of it is... Um, um, not being yourself even, being becoming someone else to keep them so you don't lose that love because you never had, because you, you, if, I think if a woman has the love of her father, she feels strong and empowered and knows that she doesn't need anybody else, that she is worthy because her father loved her. He, he raised her and he brought her up and said, I love you. And you're important and don't let any, you know, I wish I had that father that when, you know, the man came to pick me up for a date at 16 years old, or the boy, I should say, that my father was at the door with a shotgun going, you better not mess with my daughter, you know, or I'm going to mess with you. You know, I wish I had that. You know, I had nobody there protecting me. I felt like a free for all. What do you think? your father's absence told you? Oh, absolutely, that I was not important, that I was not loved. That simple. I don't love you. What was the most, do you have, because he left I know at an early age, do you have a most memorable uh, time or experience with your dad at all? There's only two times as a child growing up that I can remember being around my dad. And one time was when he came to visit me when I lived in Germany. Uh, I remember him coming there and being there and my mom telling me that this is my dad and feeling very shy and back offish and confused. Um, knowing that my stepdad was my stepdad. Um, but I don't even really remember the time we spent together. I have a photo of like me being on his shoulders or whatever, but I don't even remember that. In fact, there's a, most of my childhood that I don't remember. So um, I do remember another time where my grandmother took my aunt and I to visit him in Colorado on the bus, and it was when my half-brother was born, and he was remarried, and, you know, his wife was weird, um, not, it wasn't warm and welcoming, it just, you know, it just felt odd, but no real connection, there's no connection there, no scooping me up in his arms, going, oh my gosh, I miss you, I love you, you know, blah, I mean, never any of that interaction even being around him. There's a, uh, there's a quote by Tony Dungy. Love him. And he talks about how we're growing up with a whole generation of men yes. who don't know what they mean to their kids. What do you think about that? Um, I, I think he's spot on. I, I definitely think there is an epidemic going on and the, the, the generation of men, and I think the church is doing a poor job, first of all. I think the church wants the people to come into the four walls, and that's not where the church really is. The church is out. Um, I just think it's sad because it just it keeps following generations. And who, who gets to break that generational curse? I mean, who gets to help these people at some point? Someone stand up and say, you know, this is a problem. Because um, some of these men don't know how to do it. They've never, 
You know, you listen to the prison kids, they've never even heard the word respect. And then what they've been taught about it is something completely different than what it is. You know, it's more demanding it and not knowing how to give it. Um, I mean, Tony is right on. And I don't know how, I mean, th there's got to be something. This movie is going to help. Something has to be done to help these men, these boys. And it starts with the boys. So I love all the men out there, just have to say, th that are focusing on the children and mentoring the children because that's where it starts. If you could say one thing to your father right now, what would it be? <laughs> You know, I've often thought about that because even after I came out of the meadows, I thought I was going to tell him what he, you know, what he did and let him know the impact. What, ha what happened to me for him, from him not being there, um, I don't, I, I really, I went back and forth with it. Should I say something? Should I not? Um, would it even matter? You know? But he even care. Um, so I think the thing that I would tell him, though, is that I forgive him. That's really the only thing that I could say to him is that I forgive you. What advice would you give the men out there right now that are fathers? That are fathers? I would tell them to be present in their kids' presence, to be intentional. But, but aside from that, that whatever struggles they have going on, they need to get help first. Um, they, you know, love is unconditional and it's not selfish. And so whatever, even if they think that they're doing a good job, I would ask them to reevaluate what they're doing, um, to get good counsel, good mentor, talk with other um, fathers that have a good relationship with their kid, whether you have a good one or not. I definitely, I definitely ask men that think that they do to reevaluate what's going on, but um, they, they need to be purposeful, to be purposeful, to take a, you know, God says put God first, and then your marriage, and then your kids. Um, but sometimes our kids have to come first before our selfish needs, meaning that, you know, especially if you're a single father and you get your kids every other weekend, be intentional with that weekend. Be there. Show up. Do what you say you're going to do. Be consistent. Show them. Showing them that you love them is, is being there. That's the way they understand it. It's not just a, I love you at the end of the phone call. And it's not, um, yeah, I, I'm going to take you to a movie and then not taking them. You can't do that to a kid. You have to do what you say you're going to do. Um, so, sh so be there, you know, for fathers that are in the home, that are married. Um, show them how much you love your wife. Teach them how to be a good hu um, husband and being a good father. And if you think you're being a good father... Re, just reevaluate it and step back and go, am I? And, and, just, and take, a, just take a look at yourself and, and deal with whatever junk you have going on and go get help and, and, and do what you need to do to raise those kids right. Because if not, we're just going to keep repeating a cycle. You know, I never wanted for my kid what I had to go through, and I was very intentional about raising him that way. So... Um, you know, I was very protective, very loving, very physically loving even, um, hugging him, letting him know, um, words of affirmation, you know, stability, structure. And, you know, those are some of the things that kids need. Um, they don't need antagonism. They don't need sarcasm. They don't need your name calling. You know, they, um, they need understanding and patience and guidance um, and and telling a kid, oh, we don't do that without an explanation isn't helping them. So I just, you know, go get parenting books. Go talk to some of the experts. Go talk to your, you know, your church leaders or, you know, friends that you know that appear to be great fathers to you that have a great relationship with their kids. You know, you don't want to go talk to the father that their kid's a bully in the classroom. 
I mean, you know, you wouldn't get um, advice on money from a guy who didn't have any. So you have to go to the right people. Um, but you have to be intentional. And if for those of you who aren't fathers that think you want to be a father that can't wait to have kids, make sure you have all your stuff right before you do it. It's, it's a big responsibility. You're dealing with another human being. I don't think people really realize what they have or what, what having a kid means. What do you think is the best thing a father can do for a child? Not having one, not having had one, that's a, that's a tough question for me. But, um, you know, I can come from the mother's point of view. Um, but I personally, I would say being there. Okay. Mm. What's the worst thing? Not following through not following through and th and that could be on anything it could be not following through on something you promised them it could be not following through on um raising them up in the way that they should go it could mean not following them through with showing them that you love them um so uh, not you know not following through as your as the responsibility you have as a father so, you know, but it, for me, I would say abandon, abandonment, but it's, it's, there's so much more because you can still be present and there and still not be doing your job. If you had a friend who was going to be a father for the first time, what advice would you give them? Um, I, knowing myself, I probably wouldn't give advice at first. I would probably ask him some questions. I would ask him what his thoughts are on parenting, you know? Has he thought about it? And, you know, what does he think a father is? Um, I would spur conversation that way first because I want them to think about, I want to, you know, I would want to hear his answers and where he's at before I would say anything to him. So I would know what to say to him. Um, but it's important that they, and by asking them questions, they it makes them think about it and um, where they're at and what they have in mind. Because a lot of times, you know, you, you just get lame on the surface answers. And so, um, but I would, I would tell him that he needs to think about the responsibility and what it actually means to be a father and take a look at his own life um, and look at the good and bad. And then, you know, do the opposite of the bad and keep the good. You know, as, as far as men or families leaving the church and then going back home thinking that they're parenting correctly, um, you know, just because they did the checklist, now we went to church, this is what we're supposed to do, and then you come home and you're yelling at your kids and you're yelling at your wife or, you know, you lose your patience or temper. Those are things that are not acceptable. And, and what makes a good parent is that when a parent yells or, or loses his patience and then says, you know what, I am sorry I did that. That had nothing to do with you. That, had to, that was all me, and I apologize. Can you forgive me? That's the kind of stuff that the examples that kids need to see. They need to know that they're loved unconditionally, that their love is not based on performance, that, wow, you know, my dad loves me as long as I make straight A's, you know? And so that's what they feel like they have to do. So they're always striving for performance. And, and I see that so much. Um, but they need to know that, you know what, I, I love you no matter what, no matter whether you make an A or an F. But, you know, there's going to be consequences, you know, good and bad consequences to good and bad actions. And so um, just that consistency of knowing, well, you know what, they need to understand that if you're asking them to make an A, it's coming from a place of only for their best and not for your love. And, um, but church, they, and, and they, you know what? Men need to step up and start being the spiritual leaders in their household. That's, I feel like today that women are playing both roles and, and we were not designed to do that. 
You know, the men were, were designed to be the providers and the spiritual leaders of the household. And that's their job and their responsibility and raise their children up in the way that they should go. And um, they're not doing that. There's a lack of that. And it, it really is an epidemic. And women, you know, women are exhausted and we can't do both roles. And then we're becoming bad parents also because we can't fulfill both roles. We can do our best. And I think there are a lot of women out there, especially in single parent homes, that do a great job and we're forced to do it. But, you know, especially for the men that are um, married with families that are in the home, they need to step up and become the spiritual leader. And I, and I would say no matter what's going on with them, whatever stuff they're dealing with, they need to deal with their stuff and take responsibility of their family. Um, and the, for the men that are not in the home, you're a single dad, you're still the dad. You're still their father. Nothing changes because you're not living as a family unit. And so you still need to be the spiritual leader for that child. And you still need to be their father. And you need to show up and be present and do what you say and love that child and let them know that it doesn't matter what's happened and admit that you've made a mistake. It's okay for us to admit that we make mistakes. That's what our kids need to hear. You know what? I made a mistake and I'm working through it and I'm doing the best that I can, but I still love you and it's not your fault. And I'm sorry if any of this is burdening you or you're taking any of this on or I'm not there for you. You know, just simple things like that. It makes such a difference to a child. Watch the Father Effect movie for free on YouTube.